We're going to be uh, diving into Luke in the 16th chapter, and so maybe you're more old-fashioned, you get brought your Bible, amen to that. Go ahead and get over to Luke 16, we're going to dive right in. Say amen when you get there, church. And if you're watching online, go ahead and type that in the chat, in the comments, amen. Let's get us rolling. Here we go. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he feasted sumptuously every single day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's side. The rich man also what? And was? And in? Being in? He lift up his? That's right. This rich man, he dies, he's buried, and he lift up his eyes in Hades, being in torment goes on to say, he saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus was at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. That's right. Father, we come to you today asking you to open our eyes and hearts to receive your grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, um, some people hear this story, and you know what this story they think it is? They think it is a fairy tale designed only to scare you into going to church, to scare you into not living a broad path life, a, a worldly, secular life. They think that's what this is. And, and you know, the, the reality is they think it's no different than the story of Little Red Riding Hood. You know, the story of Little Red Riding Hood was designed to scare little children into obeying their parents. You know that, right? I mean, think about it. There's, what, what, what do they do? They say, your grandmother's sick, and they tell Little Red Riding Hood, take this food to grandma's house so that grandma can, can eat today. Don't stop and talk to any strangers. What should she do? She stops and talks to a wolf, tells her her destination. Wolf runs ahead, eats grandma. And then in some versions, Little Red Riding Hood gets eaten, and if you're a little child hearing that, and she's only saved because these woodsmen come out and kill the, the wolf and, and cut the belly open, and then she survives, right? Think about the trauma they're putting little kids in nursery rhymes, right? Like, obey your parents, you'll get eaten by a wolf, and somebody have to cut you out of its stomach, right? And, and by the way, you'd be guilty of murdering your grandma, by the way, you know, in a little, what a fairy tale, right? But some people think there's no difference than the story of Little Red Riding Hood than Lazarus and the rich man. Now, the question is like, How do you know? How do you know that this is not a story fabricated to scare us into living or conforming to some set of morality? How do you know that? Well, it's either revelation, God's revelation, or it's your speculation, right? And and for many, many years, I speculated that I wasn't going to hell. I didn't have a problem believing in a hell or believing in a heaven. I just knew I was going to heaven. And it wasn't because I was raised in church because I was not. I wasn't saved until I was 26 years old. But but I had this false sense of security. I thought, well, I'm living a better life than most, so surely God will let me in. It's like I believe God graded on a curve or something, right? Um, and, And I speculated for many, many, many years. And... The Bible itself says this. It says that God reveals himself. Like all those years when I was sitting in deer stands, I was blind to this, but the reality is is I could look out and I could see God's creation. And the Bible says that the creation itself testifies that there's a God. That this idea of created order, like everything on planet earth works, right? The earth is exact distance from the sun, that we don't freeze to death or burn up right? Everything here works by design, meaning pointing back to the fact that there is a creator or a designer. So the Bible says God reveals himself, and all those years of sitting in deer stands or running to rodeos, I never once looked at creation and thought, wow, there's a creator, and I should have. I was blind to that. So you know, God goes to another link, because I wasn't the only person that didn't see creation and instantly go, there's a creator. God sent his son to this earth to reveal his message. Jesus Christ revealed God's message, right? He did that, so, so God went to incredible lengths to reveal himself to you. He also gave us this, his word. Now, some people have speculated about his word. I'd like to give you a little confidence in the Bible this morning. 
I'm not telling you to believe this because I tell you to believe this. Let's just look at the facts. From the, front, the first book to the last book, 66 of them, they were written over a span of 1,500 years by 40 different authors by 1,500 years. Think about that. There's nobody alive that knows the first one or even the middle one. All these authors didn't just sit down in one place at one time and start writing. It was over a span of 1,500 years. They were written on three different continents, which meant the Bible was written in three different languages. And some of the authors didn't speak the other language. And yet this book comes together without one issue, without one error. It literally comes together and tells one message. And it is tried and true. It is the bestseller every year. Every year, this is the top of the bestseller. There more Bibles are sold than any other book in the entire year. Why is that? Because people trust that this is, this is the truth. 300 prophecies alone. What's a prophecy? Someone saying this is going to happen years before it happens, hundreds of years before it happens. 300 prophecies alone fulfilled in Jesus' life. Where he was born, what he would do, where he would die, who's, where he would be buried, that he would rise again from the dead, all hundreds of years before it actually took place. And this book captures that message. You know, people are like, well, how do we know? Has the Bible changed over all of those years? Let me tell you about the meticulous efforts they went to to make certain that the truth is captured and remained in this book. This is what they did. They, when someone had a manuscript and they had they, one of these authors wrote the book, other people wanted copies. And so they went through this meticulous process of, tra it's called transmission. And so they would write down what the other book had. Now there's opportunity for human error there, right? Because I'm writing a copy and if you were to copy something, there's human. So what did they do? They went from book to book. They would count the letters in the words. So this is kind of how it would go. They'd flip to this page and they'd say, okay, here's this word. They would then count backwards. How many words are in your copy? How many words are in my copy? Oh, your word has 499 words before this word? Well, mine has 503. They just throw it away. They just throw it away. That can't be trusted. They counted the number of words. They counted the number of characters in the Bible in each word. That They went through this crazy, insane process to preserve God's word for you. I believe it. I believe it's true. And you know, if you were to go to college right now and you were to go to a, um, an accredited university and you were to sit down and, and let's say you took a philosophy class, they might reference other, uh, other ancient writing, uh, authors like Homer and, 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 and uh, Plato. And do you know that, that they teach those ancient writings as if they were fact? They literally say, yes, these are, these are what this guy wrote. You can trust it. You can believe it. It's fact. Do you know that Plato's writings, we, we have 210 copies. And of the 210 copies, the university says, that's enough for us to say we can trust this and teach this to students as if it's fact that he wrote it. Homer, we have 1,800 copies of his ancient writings, right? But yet, these same colleges and universities seem to balk at the fact that the Bible and it's like, well, then let's do some comparisons. Manuscript versus manuscript. Let's see how many of these really exist, right? Well, today we have 5,800 Greek manuscripts. How many did I say for Plato? 210. We have 5,800 Greek manuscripts preserved in the manner I just described. We have over 10,000 copies of manuscripts in Latin. We have 9,300 other manuscripts in various languages, far greater than any of your college or universities. We have much more evidence that this was written by 40 different people on three continents in three different languages, divinely inspired by God. The, the evidence is overwhelming. And so I want to tell you it, this, this truth that Lazarus and the rich man, and when they died, one went to heaven and one went to hell is absolutely true because it's been preserved for you in God's writing. It's a story that has been told for thousands of years by God's son to warn you, not to conform to some moral code, but to warn you to turn from your sins and put your heart and faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior so that you could be rescued. The Bible is true. And if the Bible is true, that means hell is real. 
The Bible is true, and since the Bible is true, hell is real. And and some people would say this. They would say, well, isn't hell just the end? Like some people like to rationalize and say, you know, I believe that we live a life, we're born, we live, we die, and then it's just over. It's just over. Well, let's look at what verse 22 says because I think it answers that question for us. I think we can stop speculating and start trusting in God's revelation. It says this, the poor man died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's side. That's a reference to heaven. The rich man also, what did he do? He croaked and was what? He was put six feet under and in what? And in Hades, being in in torment, he lifted up his, his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Some of you would believe that when this life is over, it's just over. But the Bible, God's divine revelation, written on three continents by 40 different authors over 1,500 years in three different languages, and have prophecy after prophecy after prophecy coming true says that when you die, that's not just the end. You can trust your speculation or you can trust God's revelation. The man on the cross, Jesus Christ in the middle cross, he said to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. One thief listened and believed. The other thief rejected and did not find himself in heaven. But he too opened his eyes in hell, being in torment. The rich man was buried. His body was buried. The funeral was over. But his life was not over. Your body goes into the ground, but your soul goes to hell if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the Bible says this. It says that the rich man also died and was buried. And then in Hades, being in torment, real pain, real affliction, was like, just send Lazarus down. Just send Lazarus down and, and, and let him just dip the tip of his finger that maybe just a drop of comfort could come to me because I'm in torment in this flame. I'm here to tell you it's not just the end. It's not just the end. When your last heart beats and your last breath leaves your body, eternity has begun. It's not just the ending. When I think about the question that's probably coming to your mind, and it came to mind various times in the first 26 years of my life, was like, do people really deserve hell? Like, there's a lot of questions about that. Like, how does a loving God cast people into hell? How does that happen? Like, how could that be? And then the the idea is like, do I really deserve hell? I was okay with somebody else deserving hell. Uh, You know, the pedophiles and the people who have hurt children and women. I was okay with those folks going to hell. If you're a murderer or a serial killer, I was okay as a lost person with you going to hell. But surely not me. I mean, I've not killed anybody. I've not done any awful things like that. What was I doing? I was measuring my life by somebody else. And I was thinking, well, I'm better than them, so God will let me in. As if God grades on a curve. As if God lowers the standard or plays favorites. But the God of this Bible doesn't do that. He has a standard. It's his word. Do we really deserve hell? You know, when I I read this story... um, I didn't get it at first. Let's let's read this. Let's look at the guy that ended up in hell. Let's look at how he lived his life. It says in the 19th verse, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted what? Sumptuously every single day. He had more than enough. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. You understand that? He had so much food just falling in the floor. A poor man outside at his gate, 100 yards away maybe, right? 100 yards away, starving to death. Well, let's go on. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his source. But Abraham said, child, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is what? He's comforted here in heaven and you are what? You're in anguish in his flame. You know, when you first read that, you're like, well, there's this great reversal. So what is it? Is it that rich people... People who have a good life in this life, they don't get to go to heaven, they go to hell? And is it the people that are poor and the homeless and the, they get to go to heaven? I mean, at first that can be confusing, can it not? But Abraham said, child, remember in this lifetime you receive good things. 
and Lazarus there, and there's this great reversal that happens. And it, on the surface, it kind of feels that way, doesn't it? That if you've had a good life here, and well, that would be bad news for all of us because you've you got running water and, and you got a roof overhead and you got access to food, right? So you are part of the elite on planet Earth. I mean, that's just the reality. We are all the rich man here, and that would be doom and gloom for us. But I, I believe that there's a deeper meaning in why Jesus is telling this story. And that is the rich man, he lives sumptuously every single day, completely oblivious to the other needs around him. And what does the Bible say are the two greatest commands in God's law? That all of the law and all the prophets hang on, that you love God with all of your heart, soul, and strength, and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Lazarus sitting out the gates. It was obvious this rich man, God wasn't against him because he had wealth, and God wasn't against him that, that he had a comfortable life, as if all of us in this room have. He wasn't against us for that very reason. It was that this rich man lived a self-absorbed life, me, myself, and I, which is what happens when you were a sinner. When you were a sinner, you're worried about where your next meal is coming from, how you might get your next car, how you might get your next thing and your next item, and you are completely oblivious to the needs of others around you. A couple weeks ago, sitting in a room full of pastors at a restaurant, I noticed that um, God, a lot of the guys were having coffee and only drinking coffee, and we sat there for two and a half hours, and I thought to myself, what's this waitress going to, to make off of this table? <laughs> Boy, what's a cup of coffee cost at Bob Evans? Anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Throw out a number. $3. Three bucks, two bucks, a cup of coffee? This lady's been at our table for two and a half hours, never letting her thing go dry, and if you had a $2 check, what would your tip be? A couple bucks? But yet I've sat here at this table for two and a half hours and somebody else could have came down and ordered a meal. So I said, give me the tickets for all of their coffees and my meal because I, I was hungry. I eat breakfast. I'm not going to lie. I get to the register and I said, hey, we've been here two and a half hours. Can you tell me, can you tell me um, what would she have made in tips in that time? And then I'm like, well, we don't really know. We're kind of slow. And I said, okay. So I said, would 60 be enough? And she goes, what? I go, would $60 be enough on a tip? And she said, she said, uh, next thing she said was, hey, Shirley, you need to say thank you to this man. He just tipped 60 bucks, you know. I looked over and Shirley was crying. She said, you don't know the difference that made. At church, I'm going to tell you something. $60 doesn't make a difference in my pocket. It made a difference in her pocket. That's not something the rich man ever thought about as he had a poor person right out the end of his gate. Never once did he think about Lazarus. He saw the need. He knew who Lazarus was. He even wanted Lazarus to serve him in hell. Give me a little torment, a little bit of relief. You see the heart of a self-consumed individual for answering the question, do you deserve to go to hell? Absolutely you deserve to go to hell. Why? Because you have not loved God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Your creator, the one who sent his son to die on a cross, you won't even acknowledge that. You won't live for him, you live against him. His commands are clear, and they're for us, and all of us have violated those commands. You absolutely deserve to go to hell. You know, it's better to lose your life than to waste it. And I'm going to tell you, the average American today is so busy wasting it all of their income used for themselves, all of their time used for bringing themselves joy. Right. 20, I guess it was 26 years ago today, uh, I, well, not today, 26 years ago, I met Christ. I met Christ and something shifted and something changed in my life. I went from only being consumed with my own needs and my own wants. As a lost person, when I went to rodeos, I would get behind the the shoots, and let me tell you how I prayed. God, let me win and keep me safe. That's how I prayed. That was my prayer life for 26 years, well, for 10 years as I rode bulls. God, it's not that you don't pray. Listen to the content of what you pray, me, myself, and I. Let me win. Let me be healthy. God, let me get the promotion. Let me get the raise. You're no different than this rich man sitting at his table every single day, living sumptuously, right? You got to go to a closet and figure out what are you going to wear? You got 42 pairs of tennis shoes, ladies, right? What shoes am I going to wear? What leggings am I going to throw on? You've got three dressers full of leggings. What are you going to wear? You're living sumptuously every single day. All the while, 
people around you suffering and in pain and hurt and you're oblivious to that fact do we really deserve hell absolutely you know people think heaven's owed to them do you know that have you ever been to that funeral where people people just get there and you know the guy and the guy didn't know Jesus and the guy didn't go to church and the guy didn't serve God didn't love God he was this rich man living for himself and then some clown in a suit and tie gets up there holding the Bible saying well yeah he was a good old soul and told you every funny story about him and we'll see him again in heaven one day that's a lie Church, that's a lie. There's nothing you can do to earn heaven. You aren't deserved it. You don't owe it. You deserve hell because you've sinned against your creator. I deserve hell. It's not me pointing my finger at you. I deserve hell. <clears throat> like, well, how could I deserve hell? Like, I'm, I've never killed anybody and I'm a good parent. Well, isn't that self-serving to be a good parent? Because if you're a lousy parent, guess what? You're going to have a lot of hard years when they get to be teenagers and 20-somethings. If you're a lousy parent, oh my gosh, you're not going to have somebody take care of you when you're older. You're going to have to look to others to do that. That's pretty self-serving. And, and so even in that, I see the rich man, right? I see the rich man for, for, right up front with that. You know, there was a time when I looked at poor people and they used to say, well, why don't they just get a job? You don't want to be out there starving, hurting, hungry. Just get a job. Work hard like me. Get a job. Work like me. Don't be lazy like me. Can't you just hear the rich man saying that as he's sitting at his dinner table eating sumptuously? Food falling off the table, right? And there's a hungry person out there. He's like, well, if Lazarus wants something, he should work for it. <laughs> I used to think that way. I was not sympathetic to the fact that life's hangups and ha hurts and habits get into f and impact people's lives. Don't get me wrong, I still believe you shouldn't be lazy in this world. God designed something that, you know, keeps you from being lazy. It's called hunger. You get hungry, you'll work. But when am I way more sensitive to the needs of other people around me now? I don't want to be that rich man. And yet by design, by my sinful nature and my fallenness, I was that rich man. And some of you are still that rich man. And you need to hear this. The Bible says we've all been that rich man. We've all sinned against God. And the penalty of sin is death. And there are three deaths. There's the physical death that you know of, that you mourn and you grieve, and there's a burial and a funeral, and, and, and there's that. But there's also spiritual death. And when you sin against God, you are spiritually separated from him. You're not connected with him anymore. You don't belong to him. You're separated from God. And then the Bible speaks of eternal death, and that's when the funeral is over. And your crying relatives are gone home, and your eyes open up in Hades. And the realization hits you that there is pain all around you, and that you're in torment, and you're in anguish as the flames burn your soul. And there's the realization that there is no escaping hell now. You've waited too long. You've rejected God your entire life. And you are going to hell. You're here. And you're begging and you're pleading. And someone reminds you there's a great gulf in between here and there. And there's nobody that's ever left. This rich man, since Jesus spoke of him, has been in anguish ever since that time. That funeral happened even now. And will for all eternity. At the end of this life, it's not just over. There is a devil's hell that you will go to and be tormented for the rest of your life. The Bible says the wage of sin is death. What you get because you're a sinner is death, physical, spiritual, and eternal. Some of you are still arguing with me, but I don't really deserve it. I don't really deserve it. Even Jesus, when they called him a good teacher, he said, why do you call me good? None of you believe that I'm God. But the reality is, is that God's the only one that's good. Everybody else isn't. Jesus' mother needed a savior, just like you need a savior. The wage of sin is death. And then the beautiful part of Romans 6, 23 is, but the free gift of eternal life is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The free gift, meaning you can't earn it. All right. 
I want to answer you the question, yes, you deserve to go to hell. Yes, hell is real. It's not just a fictitious story. At the end of this life, if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's where you're going. That was what the rich man realized in his state of torment. And do you know where his next thought went? It went to his one. And he had five ones. He said, I got five brothers. And guess what they're doing? They're living a a self-absorbed life as well. They're not going to church. They're not reading the Bible. They're not being generous to the poor. They're not giving money to the church and, and serving in the church. They're not loving God with all their heart, soul, and strength. They're not trying to walk the narrow path. No, they're sitting at the same table I sat at, living sumptuously every day, only thinking of themselves, living for themselves, wanting to get more, wanting to have a good day, wanting to do their own thing, their own way, with no one telling them what to do. And this rich man who opens his eyes in hell realizes, I got five brothers who are coming here. So then the begging starts. Oh, 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 Father Abraham, Father Abraham, just, just, just tell you what, send Lazarus, just send Lazarus and let him go, let him go tell my five brothers. And, and he said, you know what, if someone, if someone just goes from the dead, then they'll believe. What's that tell you about that rich man? He knew that Lazarus had died. He knew that that man probably found him dead at the end of his gate. He stepped right on around him to probably go to the grocery store. Probably complained to somebody to come pick up this corpse out there, right? He knew Lazarus was dead. And he said, my brothers know Lazarus is dead. And here's the reality. If, if Lazarus will leave heaven and come back to earth, guess what? Then they'll know. Then they'll realize. And you know what, you know what Jesus told him? He said this. He said, they have the law and they have the prophets. And you think, man, that's harsh. They have the law. What does the law do? The law convicts you of your sin. You see a speed, a speed limit sign and you go past it, you know you're breaking the law. Stop lying to them cops. You know I'm speeding. Uh, you've heard the whole, you know, eight, you're fine, nine, you're mine kind of mentality from a cop. You know, I'll give you eight. I'll give you the law doesn't do that. It gives you right at the point. You will love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. You will love your neighbor as yourself. And if you don't do that, you are guilty of breaking my law. And the penalty of that is, Physical death, spiritual death, and eternal death. And, and it says in that they have the law and the prophets. So what do the prophets do? The prophets preach repentance. The greatest prophet in all the scriptures was John the Baptist. He never did a single miracle. And do you know what, what the greatest prophet in all the world, do you know what he said? This was his message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from your wicked ways. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is coming. Make your crooked paths, make them straight. Begin to love God. Begin to love others. That's what he's saying. Turn. What is repentance? Turning from my sin towards God. The law's point is to convict and the prophet's point is to encourage you and encourage you to turn to God to repent of your sins and put your faith and trust in the Savior. One day, John the Baptist was walking with his own disciples and he looked up and he saw Jesus coming. And this is what he says in John 1, 29. It says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Want to know why John was the greatest prophet to ever live? because his message was simple and clear. Jesus Christ is God's son who died on a cross for your sin because my God is a just God. He is a just God. He doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't lower a standard for some. He doesn't play favorites. No, he sent his son to die on a cross because the wage of sin, what you earned for your sin was death. He took our death upon him that he could say this to you I forgive you I forgive you this morning you have a wonderful opportunity it's an opportunity to turn from your sin and turn to Christ 
There's not one of us in this room that's better than the other. There's just some of us in this room that have been forgiven. I look through this crowd. Not only am I concerned about your one like you are. We're just weeks away from that big day of friend day. But I can't help but think like, what if, what if somebody, what if somebody in this row or what if somebody in that row or what if somebody in this row back here or maybe that row back there what if they're living that rich man's life hey, look around this room for just a second look at the people that are in this room we should not assume that all of us have been saved and born again we can't make that assumption as a lost person I went to church occasionally when my wife complained enough I went is that you? I did not love God with all my heart, soul, and strength. I surely didn't love others like I love myself. I was going to that devil's hell. Where are you going for eternity? I believe that God left me here. As I said earlier, 20 years ago today, I was being flown to St. Louis, and would have a brain surgery, and they'd put two tiny titanium clips in my head, and. 18 days later, I'd walk out of that hospital with no deficits, no issues. And seven months later, I'd return to work. And about five months later, this church was started. And over the last 20 years, I believe that he's left me here to tell you this message. What if today God brought you here on the 20th anniversary of my aneurysm so that you could have eternal life? If I die tomorrow, you've heard. You've been invited. But in this moment, in this time, you have to make a decision. Am I going to continue to live for self? Am I going to accept God's Son and live for Him? This is your moment, church. Now, I want you to escape that hell. I do not want you to open your eyes in Hades. I want you to open your eyes and hear an opposite. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. And before you think you've done too much and you've gone too far, understand that the same Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You're part of that whoever. You're here this morning to be saved. And all you have to do is turn from your sin to repent and turn your heart back to God. If you don't know where you're going, God does. And he wants to change that today. Just come forward. Meet me on this altar. I'm going to be praying for you. My hope is, is that you'll come forward and you'll bring the name of that one that you're praying for. And beg God like the rich man begged for his brothers, like I'm going to be begging God for you. Let's pray. Father, we come here today and we ask you, there are people in this room and watching online that need your Lord and Savior. And Lord, today, if there's somebody in this room that doesn't know you, God, I pray they would find their way up here. That they would come quickly. They would yield their life to you, God, and just say they're sorry for their sin and put their faith and trust in you. Let today be the day, God, when someone comes and accepts you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.